The city's next swamp is due for adoption by 2026, a mere four years from now, uh, barely enough time, which is why early stage thinking about the swamp is getting some attention and why we organized uh, today's panel. In my work across the US and Canada, I've observed really excellent thinking about the, both the substance and process of planning to support the essential day-to-day -day management of waste of all types generated by the cities in which we live, work, and play. New York City sometimes has a reputation for not bothering to learn from other cities, but that's the point of today's discussion, to build bridges for information sharing, learning, and collective action. Today's four panelists from Boston, Austin, Toronto, and Metro Vancouver readily accepted our invitation to participate in this discussion as true colleagues, which we very much appreciate. So a few housekeeping notes. Yes, the session will be recorded. Uh, the full presentation package will be circulated to attendees along with the recording link. The format will be 10 minute presentations followed by 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, Unfortunately, council member Sandra Nurse, who we were hoping to join us uh, today, got called to a full meeting of the council this afternoon, but we uh, will be supported during that discussion by Jennifer McDonald, who I will introduce in a second. We will also have some time for audience questions at the end, so please use the chat function to ask them in writing. Um, I'm not prone to introductory biographies. They're readily available online for all of today's presenters. So let's begin with our first presenter is Sarah Ivanis from Metro Vancouver. Sarah. Hi, good afternoon, good morning. I'm in Vancouver where it's still morning. Um, thanks Kendall for the overview and introduction. I'm really happy to be here today with the rest of the other folks on this panel. And I'm really excited to almost be in New York City again. I did my MPA at NYU at the Wagner School and worked at EDC for a couple of years. So it's great to kind of almost be back. Um, I'm joining you today from the Metro Vancouver region on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada. And it's customary in our country and in our region to begin a session such as this by acknowledging the indigenous peoples on whose lands um, we are located. So I'd like to begin today's session in a good way by just expressing my gratitude for being with you all from the respective and shared territories of the 10 local First Nations communities that call this region home. And I'd also like to thank the Indigenous peoples currently without lands in our region, the Métis citizens and Inuit people for making this meeting um, possible today. So thank you. My name is Sarah Evanitz and I'm the Division Manager for Solid Waste Strategy and Stakeholder Relations at Metro Vancouver. Next slide, please. So I'll give you a bit of an overview of who we are um, at Metro Vancouver talk a little bit about our plan update, a little bit about the circular um, directions within our plan early days, and then finish talking a bit about engagement. So Metro Vancouver, we're a regional order of government here in British Columbia. We're a federation. We um, include about half the population of the province of BC and a little bit more in terms of the economic um, size. Next slide, please. So as a regional government, we provide a wide range of services. So the MVRD plat provides a number of sort of regional planning services, climate change, housing, air quality, just to name a few. We have a housing corporation. We have a water utility, a liquid waste utility, and I work in our solid waste services group. And in solid waste services, we provide some services. So we run a regional network of recycling and waste centers a waste to energy facility, and there's a landfill in our region. We also provide zero waste programming and we provide solid waste recycling, zero waste planning for the region. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today. Next slide, please. So our existing plan was approved by our province um, just over 10 years ago, and we are kind of a creature of the province. So the work of our region is mandated through provincial legislation. And, the goals of our existing plan are um, really kind of the traditional waste hierarchy. Next slide, please. So we've been um, approved by our board to update our plan and they've really challenged us to accelerate waste reduction and diversion. Um, I know we all count um, diversion rates differently, but here in our region, we've 
sat around 62, 63, 64, 63 percent for many years now. And there's a real desire to advance that. We need to do something differently. We need some transformation to be able to make more progress. Um, We've also been challenged to kind of promote a circular economy and start on that journey. And this plan will be one step in that. And a reduction of greenhouse gases is another big driver in our plan update. Next slide, please. So in some early conversations we've had, and we're just starting in this journey, but there's been a lot of interest in this plan and helping us advance on a number of fronts. Um, some that I've mentioned, but the, the interest in the stakeholders, business, industry, citizens, communities of interest, it's broad. Next slide, please. So I wanna to touch a little bit on some circular initiatives given you know, that this um, presentations in the context of, of you know, circular cities. Um, I think as a regional government, we're really well placed to kind of catalyze, start the conversation, bring together folks to talk about circular initiatives, a transition to circular economy. I sat in on a session earlier today that was run by our National Zero Waste Council and a number of really compelling and, and smart folks talking about the issue. And you know, a few things struck me, the importance one of kind of collaboration and innovation being really central, the idea of you know, we're early in a journey and we need to think broadly um, and we need to innovate and make mistakes and be willing to adjust and change. And, and also the importance of kind of engagement in that process that through engagement, we have a really important role in terms of kind of educating folks, but promoting learning from each other in order to kind of start down that journey. So we're quite excited to have this um, transition be part of our planning process. Next slide, please. So just want to touch on a few things really quickly. I have way too many slides for a 10 minute presentation, but as part of our plan update, we have commissioned a number of kind of foundational studies, one of which is a circular economy study that will really help provide some background that will kickstart the conversations um, within the public engagement sphere, but also to help guide staff in its thinking. Next slides, please. So while we're on this you know, multi-year planning process, work continues. And so it's really important for us to continue to kind of invest in programs and projects and plans. And I've just noted a couple here that have a circular lens to them. So you know, COVID, we're opening up a little bit more and there's a lot of interest in kind of reconnecting through these community repair cafes. We have a really compelling organization that works locally, but also regionally and nationally as well, Food Mesh that's um, developing a regional food recovery network for us. And, and there's a number of other projects, but I just wanted to flag those two. Next slide, please. And Metro Vancouver, and many of you might be familiar with these because they get used nationally and internationally sometimes as well. We invest in a lot of behavioral ch change campaigns and we make this av information available publicly, but we've had some really kind of compelling ones recently around food waste reduction, around, um, green bin around um, think thrice about your clothes so textiles um, reduction and recovery and recycling and then a create memories not garbage campaign around Christmas time. Next slide please. And I'd also be remiss not to kind of flag the, the role of the National Zero Waste Council. So Metro Vancouver created this initiative over 10 years now and it's quite active nationally. And I know Megan from Toronto um, is involved in the National Zero Waste Council and the work of the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative, which is one related initiative. So I just flagged that there's a lot of great studies and resources and exchange of information and collaboration that happens via that council. And there's a lot of information online if you'd like to follow up on that. Next slide, please. So I'd like to finish my comments just reflecting on the engagement process in this plan update. So, I mean, engagement, I think, is super critical and more now that, than ever, just given the challenges of transitioning to a circular economy, the challenges of advancing in our waste reduction goals. I think working through collaboration, through partnerships um, with industry, business, residents, academia, communities of interest, and Indigenous nations, of course, is going to be kind of central to the success of this, building some shared vision, co-collaborating on what this plan looks like. Next slide, please. So the proposed engagement program for our plan is, is nimble. Um, 
We have an expected time frame of two to three years. We've outlined a really transparent, inclusive, and responsive engagement. Um, a real focus on equitable opportunities for Indigenous people, stakeholders, and others to participate and provide feedback. We've really identified a number of specific methods to increase accessibility and to engage underrepresented and equity denied communities. Um, and just to note, I have a slide on it later, but while Indigenous peoples will be invited to participate in all our public engagement activities, we do have a separate Indigenous engagement approach with those nations because they are orders of government. And so we work with them differently in a kind of co-creation collaboration approach. Next slide, please. Okay. Just touching briefly on the governance framework, um, decision makers for this plan, the final approval resides with the Provincial Minister of Climate Change or Environment and Climate Change Strategy. At our board level, um, there's the decision making body and then our zero waste committee as advisors. Within the dotted line, you see a number of different kind of mechanisms, um, two of which are new and created for this plan update. We've convened an amazing um, independent consultation and engagement panel that's been advising us on the engagement, like the design of the engagement program, and they'll be kind of reviewing our implementation of that plan throughout the various phases of the plan update. We're also on the cusp of being able to announce the formation of a public and technical advisory committee that will guide us on the content of the plan throughout the plan development process. And then external to that, we have an industry advisory committee in place that um, its tenure goes beyond the plan update, but they're really critical in providing the input from industry and business into this plan engagement. And then also we have a number of different municipal and other advisory committees that we'll be working with in the plan update. Next slide, please. So reconciliation with Indigenous nations is a real priority for Metro Vancouver and the way we'll be engaging through this plan is through kind of a separate iterative and collaborative process which includes engagement with both Indigenous nations and urban Indigenous communities in our region. We're um, quite an urban region with a lot of more rural areas, but that's important for us. Um, and the work of um, engagement with Indigenous nations is really guided by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and commitments from our board to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Next and final slide, I believe. Thank you. So new to us in our planning um, this time around is really putting a explicit equity lens in our solid waste management planning. So I've talked a little bit about you know, equity considerations in the design of our public engagement program. So what sort of methods do we need to engage? What partners do we need to engage? How can we kind of work through others to get this work done? And that's a real iterative process because we've been able to connect with certain groups, but we know there's folks that we haven't and we just need to be open and flexible to continue that journey. Um, our public and technical advisory committee, um, I flagged that we, uh, actively recruited the participation of a number of representatives that have been equity denied or underrepresented in our process before. And we're making available a number of different kind of supports to, to support their participation in this plan update from you know, compensation to support with childcare or transportation technology or kind of pre and post meetings um, on, the, on the technical substance should that be required. And finally, um, we're, we're also interested in kind of the equity lens on the plan development itself, the policies, the strategies, the actions within that plan. And we've kind of incorporated equity as a criteria into the design of that circular economy study. It's a foundation, but that's just kind of a starting point for this conversation around equity considerations in, in the design of the plan. Um, next slide, please. That's it for me. I hope I haven't gone over my 10 minutes, but happy to answer any questions later and really keen to learn from all the other folks on the panel today. Thank you. Terrific. And you're right on time, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Next up, Toronto. I guess we're going sort of uh, geographically clockwise uh, today. So, Megan. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Megan Davis. I'm the manager of Circular Economy and Innovation at the City of Toronto and really happy to be here today to be able to share some of the background on how our waste strategy was developed and in particular how the context has changed uh, since then. Um, and I would like to acknowledge before we start that the City of Toronto is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And I'll also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll start by just giving another uh, introduction to our city. So Toronto is Canada's largest city, uh, the fourth largest in North America, and home to a diverse population of more than 2.9 million people. Uh, we're a global centre for business, finance, arts, and culture. Um, and we also operate one of the most comprehensive integrated waste management systems in North America, uh, managing uh, more than 780,000 tonnes of waste per year and providing an extensive, extensive range of uh, diversion options, including our Green Bin Organics program, uh, to all of our customers. Uh, and in our waste management division, we do have a goal to be an international leader as an innovative and sustainable waste management utility uh, and through investments in low carbon technologies and regenerative systems and community activations, we're able to offer circular, sustainable and cost effective waste management services to Torontonians. And if you go to the next slide, um, I do want to acknowledge that our, our ambition uh, and our mandate is larger than simply service delivery. Um, as Canada's largest city, we're not only a frontline service provider, but we're also striving to be a global solutions provider. Uh, and our government with the scale and scope in our mandate to have a national impact. And so I think that this graphic should give you a bit of a sense of that scale. Um, our division, Solid Waste Management Services, and the, the light blue there in the middle, uh, is situated in Toronto's Infrastructure and Development Services cluster. Um, and I've highlighted just a few of our core partners across the municipal government. Um, I'm sure this is not comprehensive. I hope no one uh, watching is, is uh, mad to be left out. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight uh, just the, the complexity across the organization and how important it is for us to partner uh, both in the delivery of our strategic programs and services in our policy and by law enforcement and also in the innovation projects that we're pursuing. As leaning into the, our size, our potential and our global ambition is really going to be critical to address those kind of cross jurisdictional thorny problems like waste and circularity. You move to the next slide. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the background of our, our waste strategy. Um, our current long-term waste management strategy, uh, our development of it, I should say, started in 2014. Um, and by that time, uh, in sort of the history of our waste utility, um, we'd really gone through a substantial evolution from simple garbage collection to a complex system of collecting, processing, and managing source-separated material. Um, and so the graphic on this slide shows a, a little snapshot of the state of our integrated waste management system circa 2014. Uh, when our waste strategy development process began. Uh, Toronto's 2007 diversion plan had targeted 70% diversion, and through the development of our waste strategy, we were really expanding our lens to uh, show the evolution to a triple bottom line approach to waste planning, planning uh, that seeks cost effective, socially acceptable, and environmentally sustainable policies and programs uh, that advance the five R's of waste reduction, reuse, recycling, recovery, and finally residual disposal. Uh, the development of our waste strategy was governed by five governing principles, uh, which are, were approved by our Toronto City Council and are on this slide, many of which represent some of the key drivers that, that motivated this strategy development process. Uh, but a few that I'll hi uh, highlight, of course, um, are, are really leaning into reduction, reuse, recycling and recovery before residual disposal, um, and also uh, extending the, the life of our Green Lane landfill, which is where the City of Toronto's municipal, uh, collect municipally collected garbage goes. Um, and then, of course, leaning in to an open and transparent review of our options um, and of course being responsive to emerging technologies, changes in the regulatory environment uh, and the need to be open to collaboration and innovation with, with industry and with the community. On the next slide, this graphic just highlights sort of the phases of our, our, of our work. Uh, really, there were there were three phases to the development of this, this strategy, uh, current state assessment, options analysis, and strategy development, uh, each supported by comprehensive consultation and engagement uh, with the public, input from stakeholders, and contributions from members of Toronto City Council. Uh, the strategy development considered a, a range of data points on the current aspects at the time of the city's integrated waste management system, uh, our long-term system needs and our technology options and waste projections were a very core component of that analysis uh, and were developed with consideration to variables that could impact the system including population growth housing trends economic growth product design packaging changes planning initiatives and potential legislation 
Um, we adopted a range of consultation methods to develop the strategy from uh, in-person events with the community to uh, vendor and market days with, with, uh, with industry uh, with the aim of generating two-way dialogue about the critical waste strategy development themes. And we also formed a stakeholder advisory group at the outset of the project to uh, represent a variety of interests in Toronto and in the waste management sector, uh, as well as uh, created uh, avenues for direct participation and engagement um, with, with key members of our community, including our Indigenous communities, uh, environmental groups, uh, and tenant associations. On the next slide, um, our, our long-term waste management strategies is just a few of the snapshots. It was adopted by Toronto City Council in 2016. Um, and through adopting the strategy, our council set the aspirational goals of working towards zero waste in a circular economy uh, and reaffirmed our 70% diversion target as set out in the 2007 strategy. The scope of Toronto's waste strategy is for the municipal utility um, and our full customer base, which is primarily residential. Uh, we serve just under 900,000 customers, which includes all single family households and about two thirds of the multi-residential sector in our city. Uh, and we also have some businesses and institutional customers on the utility as well. The waste strategy put forward recommendations for waste reduction, uh, reuse, recycling, and recovery, as well as residual disposal policies and programs. I and mean, what you'll see in the implementation options is a strong emphasis on education, uh, engagement, and enforcement strategies. Um, though the strategy is primarily aimed at our residential customer base, there are options for exploring uh, waste reduction approaches that could be taken to reduce ICNI waste. Um, and the, the strategy also puts forward infrastructure options uh, for the city to study longer term, um, including the, the analysis of how mixed waste processing technologies could help to maximize the amount of waste diverted from our landfill and preserve our landfill capacity. Uh, and of course, this strategy really emphasized the need to expand our organics processing capacity. But again, uh, I think this strategy really leans into the importance of building resident capacity through enhanced engagement and programming options in order to increase diversion behaviors, uh, particularly in the multi-residential sector, uh, where we have uh, some additional challenges in hitting those diverse version targets. Um, importantly, uh, Toronto's long-term waste management strategy emphasizes that it's not a static document, that waste management planning needs to be an ongoing process. And the, the recommendation was to revisit the strategy every five years to account for changes in the system. Um, and so while several of our strategy recommendations have been successfully implemented since 2016, I think what's particularly interesting and relevant right now is to reflect on some of the changes uh, that have happened uh, over the past five years and how that's impacting the way that we move forward. So on the next slide, um, I've highlighted four of the major kind of changes that, that are really driving our, our work right now. And just to go through, through the four of them quickly, um, I think really significantly in Ontario, uh, since 2016, the province of Ontario initiated the transition of several diversion programs, and most notably our Blue Box Recycling Program, to a full extended producer responsibility model. Um, on, on the City of Toronto side, uh, this is a really significant business transformation and service transformation. And so we have formed a dedicated team within the city of Toronto to plan for that transformation and to advocate for and protect the city's interests. Um, and, and the transition to EPR is really impacting the feasibility uh, as well as the implementation timelines of several strategy options. First and foremost, because several of the uh, material streams that we, are, that we were currently uh, uh, managing when the long-term waste management strategy was developed may no longer be within the stewardship responsibilities of the city of Toronto in the future. So that certainly impacts uh, the way in which we plan for the system. On the next slide, um, the, we, like many jurisdictions, we're seeing the composition of our waste changing. There are lots of factors driving this from policy changes internationally, like the national sword policies, um, to market demand, uh, and as well as the sustainability goals of major brands uh, are really impacting the way that products and packaging are being designed in our jurisdiction. And this is complicating our understanding of some of the, of the viability of some of the enhanced diversion options that were first identified in the long-term waste management strategy. Um, most notably the study of mixed waste processing and, and the contribution that that kind of investment might make, uh, given how the, the waste streams are, are changing. Um, we are also seeing uh, an increase in the volumes of fiber and other compostables in the green bin system, which is a, a planning challenge for us as our, our green bin program was originally and primarily designed for, for processing food waste. Um, and one of the ways that, that we're uh, working through these challenges is by beefing up our market engagement um, through initiatives like the, the Canada Plastics Pact and several of the other national level initiatives that Sarah uh, mentioned earlier. 
on the next slide, uh, like many cities uh, around the world, the city of Toronto has declared a climate emergency and recently adopted net zero targets. Uh, and that's changing our thinking and our, our prioritization and waste management as well. Uh, we've really been working to advance our renewable natural gas strategy uh, to, to increase beneficial uh, utilization of biogas and landfill gas uh, at the city's waste assets and to leverage those those assets to help reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions across the corporation by generating green fuels. Um, and also we're, we're really working for on uh, enhanced cross-divisional collaboration on climate actions. And the climate lens is in particular a really relevant uh, enhancement to the, the work that we're doing on the circular economy portfolio. And finally, on the next slide, uh, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has and, and continues to impact our, our waste management planning operation uh, in Toronto. Um, it has delayed and slowed several waste initiatives, including the update of the waste management strategy, um, get, given that the City of Toronto has been prioritizing the emergency response over the past two years. We've also seen some changes in, in consumption and disposal patterns that may impact waste streams moving forward. And so ongoing monitoring to understand the extent and the implications and the longevity of these changes. Uh, and what they imply for system planning is going to be very important in Toronto. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the pandemic has really heightened the need to bring new lenses to our work, especially on circular economy, looking at outcomes like economic recovery and a renewed focus on equity uh, outcomes in our work as well. And so on the next slide, uh, we will be moving forward soon with the, the five-year review, I guess more of a six-year review at this point of the city's long-term waste management strategy. Um, as well, there are several other uh, dedicated planning initiatives underway tied to our, our immediate research agenda. Um, but we're also moving forward in parallel with the development of a circular economy strategy for the city of Toronto, um, which I think really represents an evolution in our thinking about waste plans in Toronto. Um, our waste strategy identified uh, circularity as an aspirational goal. Um, and so what what my team was formed to do was to look at what that could mean in practice and what it might take to operationalize our aspirational goals. And we recently completed a, a study, um, one of Canada's first circular city scans that's really looking into that. You can check it out. Uh, all of the reports are up at toronto.ca slash circular economy. But just on the last slide, um, what I'll, I'll share in, in terms of the, the paradigm shift that we're thinking about now is we're, we're really recognizing that, you know, waste isn't just a, a resource to be hidden or a, a, an issue to be hidden from site. It's a resource to be captured. Um, and that means we need to broaden our, our understanding of the issue as not just something that waste management planning alone can solve. Um, in the city of Toronto, we recognize that the, our solid waste management services division, while responsible for managing the majority of residential waste, all city of Toronto divisions generate waste, either through their activities, um, it, or, uh, their own operational activities, as well as the activities that they enable in the community through policies, carpeting processes, etc. And so we really need a whole of government approach um, to addressing circular economy and uh, tackling that, that kind of complex, wicked problem, um, especially given the importance of sustainable consumption and circularity to Toronto's net zero and resilience goals. So um, I think this will be a really exciting time for waste management planning in Toronto as we work not only to, to revisit and enhance our strategy for our waste utility, but to also explore what types of strategies more broad than just the waste utility uh, can be adopted in order to really help reduce waste and achieve circularity in Toronto. So I'll leave it at that, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share our, our, our story and, and look forward to, to the comments and the learnings from, from the rest of the presenters. Uh, thanks, Megan. Another uh, tour de force uh, presentation. Catch your breath <laughs> and uh, join us for the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so next up, uh, I think we're in Boston. Susan. My name is Susan Casino. Um, uh, going to talk about Boston's zero waste planning process, uh, which I have been involved with from the beginning and continue to be involved with today. Uh, previous to working on the plan, I was the recycling director with Public Works for about 20 years. Next slide. Um, this plan was done under the auspices of our Zero Waste Advisory Committee, and the committee was comprised of uh, 28 members representing a cross-section of residents, businesses, and institutions, advocates through the Boston Recycling Coalition, and um, high school students. It was chaired by our mayor's chief of streets and the chief of environment and energy and open space. Next slide, please. 
So the drivers of the plan uh, uh, initially was the city's climate action plan uh, from 2014, which called for the city to launch a zero waste plan. With that, our uh, Boston Recycling Coalition nudged the city to uh, go forward and we partnered and, and applied for a grant, a $25,000 grant from the state to fund a zero waste summit. Uh, we hired zero waste, national zero waste experts um, to facilitate the summit and invited cities uh, who already had zero waste plans um, uh, uh, launched, including uh, Bob Geddert, who will hear from after me, representing uh, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And our outcome were four guiding principles for the city's zero waste plan. Next slide, please. Um, so the uh, uh, zero waste plan timeframe, the process, uh, the planning process uh, took about four years. And then the zero waste advisory committee met four times over 10 months. And we came up with 30 recommended strategies for the mayor. Next slide, please. And in terms of scope uh, for the plan, uh, it covers residential, institutional, commercial, and industrial solid waste streams. And in terms of the scope for the um, consultants whom we hired for the plan, uh, which was a $150,000 contract, uh, they were to gather and analyze data, um, do waste reduction and diversion opportunity assessments, cost benefit analysis, draft a plan, uh, and do a market development study and a public education study. Next slide, please. So in terms of data, uh, so our um, the plan needed both residential and commercial waste tonnage. Our residential tonnage comes from our public works department who is responsible for um, the management of our residents waste. And uh, then the plans ICI commercial data is based on an estimate, um, is an estimate based on the North American industry classification system for Massachusetts, as well as the 2014 California commercial generation waste study, which had tons per employee per year. In our plan, um, the, it estimates that 80% of Boston's MSW is commercial and 20% is residential. Uh, and given that data, we estimated that the city was recycling at a 25% rate. Next slide, please. In terms of community engagement, this was during, during the planning process. Um, uh, I um, have been impressed by the city of Boston in terms of um, resident uh, uh, engagement. There are over 100 community meetings that happen every month. Um, and we attended about 40 of them during this process, reaching over 1,000 residents. Uh, I did four uh, uh, commercial presentation reaching about 45 organizations. We also attended the mayor's neighborhood coffee hours um, and our four zero waste advisory committee meetings were open to the public, were live streamed, uh, standing room only. Uh, we had a webinar uh, and we also did um, um, social media. And in terms of the community meetings, um, as others have said, we talked, explained about what zero waste was, and um, we discussed waste reduction options 
uh, in terms of food composting, textiles, trash limits, and really particularly recycling more and recycling right. Next slide, please. Goal setting. So the Zero Waste Advisory Committee came up with 30 recommendations uh, for the mayor as part of the plan. And um, the 30 recommendations would get us to an 80% diversion rate by 2035. And of those uh, 22 are short-term strategies uh, that um, would be achieved by 2024 and eight long-term long strategies that uh, would be between uh, that would be achieved by 2035. And the strategies were um, categorized by uh, reduce and reuse, increase composting, recycle more, recycle right, and inspire innovation. Next slide, please. In terms of implementation, um, so of those 30 strategies, two thirds of them are underway. And most recently, uh, in terms of residential this year, uh, we have instituted curbside textile collection by appointment. We've doubled the number of food waste drop-offs through our community sites, farmers markets, and community gardens. Uh, and come this fall, we will be implementing a three-year, a phased in three-year curbside food collection uh, program as well. Then in terms of uh, commercial sector, uh, we've been focusing on organics, construction and demolition debris, waste reduction, as, and commercial data collection. Uh, we launched a deconstruction initiative um, this year, as well as uh, we are out for bid for composting at 10 of our largest public schools um, and currently evaluating our ICI data collection. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd throw this, this um, performance slide on our residential recycling rate, which is not impressive. However, um, our residential recycling rate, and this is since the implementation of the plan, um, and the needle has not moved significantly for recycling tonnage diversion for a couple of reasons. COVID, um, you need a lot of tonnage to move the needle, even a small amount, and you need citywide programs for big waste stream items like food. Uh, and for ICI, um, we have yet to figure out how we're going to measure both the numerator and the denominator for um, a recycling or diversion rate. However, as I said, we are about to launch, we just started a citywide textile program and we're about to launch a citywide um, residential food waste curbside collection program. Next slide, please. Uh, innovation. So I would say uh, one of the significant, a couple of significant things that we've done uh, in terms of innovation on the, on the commercial side uh, has been working with our historic preservation folks to support uh, reuse of buildings and building materials. Um, and it has worked both ways. We've been able to support them, giving, give them a broader network uh, of um, uh, support for the diversion uh, and preservation of building materials. And then we are also leveraging state policy compliance. The state has just uh, has a food waste ban for uh, one ton per week food waste generators. And that is about to be expanded to half ton per week or more food waste generation generators come this fall. And that leveraging that has helped us push composting at the Boston Public Schools. Then in terms of residential, uh, we Public Works um, is 
uh, expanding its workforce. It just hired a zero waste manager uh, who's from New York City, and she has been instituting some of the innovations that New York uh, has used. Uh, and also we have partnered with the Mayor's Office of Urban Mechanics and they started a Zero Waste Ambassadors Program, which launched a Zero Waste Earth Week with um, a variety of events. Next slide, please. Uh, significant changes since the plan. This is my last slide. As I said, about one new um, city employee for public works there they're adding uh, an, an additional four positions which is um, I'm very excited about and they're integrating uh, and in the environment department where I sit we're integrating our waste and emissions reduction efforts to be able to speak more in terms of embodied carbon and calculating consumption based carbon emissions uh, and lastly prioritizing food donation, reuse and repair over recycling. And thank you for listening. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Susan. So Bob, uh, bring us home to, uh, to Austin. And thank you. Thank you, Kendall. And uh, I am the former department director. I uh, happily am retired and uh, I uh, directed uh, Austin Resource Recovery into a zero waste programming. I wanna describe a little bit of the uh, uh, programs that we uh, walked through in, in the new zero waste plan. Uh, next slide. Uh, at Austin, by the numbers, Austin's the 10th largest city by US population, 1 million population. Uh, they're growing by 16,000 per year, uh, 200,000 single family residential units and 227,000 multifamily units. Uh, next slide. And um, I was the director of a, a, a city department that at one time was called Solid Waste Services. I uh, went through a renaming process. And uh, in the spirit of Austin, we went through public processes to rename our, our city and went uh, to the public to ask for na names. And we, um, many of the public uh, uh, named us after many uh, city bands and uh, national musical bands, but we ended up settling on Austin Resource Recovery as our new name. And uh, the name reflects our new services that we're in the business of recovering resources. And uh, the city um, uh, provides the service of trash, recycling, organics, bulky and large brush, um, as well as household hazardous waste, um, um, sw street sweeping, alley cleaning and dead animal collection. Um, the, the plan that I'm about to describe um, also includes ICI, the Institutional Commercial and Industrial Waste Streams, which are not collected by the city, but is controlled by city ordinances um, through the plan. Next slide, please. Um, the city council policies in adopting zero waste began back in 2005 with the adoption of the urban uh, environmental accords by the mayor's signature. And then 2009 hired a consultant to uh, develop the Austin Zero Waste Strategic Plan was a philosophical adoption of zero waste at that time. In 2011, on, under my direction and my staff's uh, much of my staff's uh, involvement, as well as uh, community involvement, many, many community meetings, more, more than 50 community meetings, um, we developed a master plan. Um, the master plan is a combination of a zero waste plan and a department plan. Um, the department plan describes how the department operates as it also is how the, how the department and the city will reach zero waste. And that was by council resolution in December of 2011. Next slide, please. Um, it, it dictated in the, in the zero waste plan, a new direction for the, the solid waste uh, department, the new uh, named department, Austin Resource Recovery. We went from a sanitation waste collection in the 30s, 40s, 50s into an integrated waste management system of the 70s, 80s, 90s into a new direction of materials management and zero waste with this new plan. Next slide. Um, it set forth new diversion goals, and I'll, I'll deal with the red 
delineation in just a minute. Um, but the green line indicates what the zero waste plan uh, dictated for the future. Um, in, in 2010, a measured 35% uh, recycling diversion goal that included organics and, and recycling. And 2014, a direct measurement of 40% as well for the city. 50% um, goal in 2015, 75%. 85 percent, 90 plus uh, onward for zero waste goal. Um, the red indicates that we did not travel along that green line um, in, in 2015, 2016. We, we traveled a little bit lower than the, the, the dictated path. And as with um, aspirational goals, um, our, our operations had to change to meet those goals. And um, in Austin, our city council held us accountable to those goals. And so going to city council and saying, what operational changes will we make to, to set course back to these goals? It was not a goal adjustment. It was an operations adjustment. And so with that discussion with city council, we added organics expansion citywide. That would be curbside um, uh, collection of food waste combined with yard waste, a textiles curbside collection, a reuse drop-off in the southern part with expansion uh, plans for a northern reuse drop-off, and uh, the consideration of moving from um, bi-weekly to weekly recycling. That hasn't happened yet. That's that last add-on um, of going weekly recycling because it's a $13 million price tag. But that would create in calculation a diversion rate to 85%. Um, that weekly recycling got put on hold because of, of COVID-19 and, and the fact that they had um, uh, 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 the, the COVID brought in a, a shortage of workers and, and you can't add on a, a recycling program when you have a shortage of workers, but that is still in the planning stages to move to the weekly recycling. Um, next slide, please. Um, 2014 actuals are really actuals. These are the tonnages. Uh, 2020 projected did not happen, but is still in the planning stages to happen. So, um, so they, this gives you the, the calculation method for these those projected numbers. Those projected numbers um, are based on tonnages collected. Um, so it's it's not pie in the sky numbers. It's actual tonnages that are calculated each year and presented to city council. This is how much is landfill. Uh, this is how much is collected recycling. This is how much is collected composting. Um, they, the, the city now collects reuse uh, numbers and adds in reuse into the calculation as well too, but only what is calculated and, and can be counted. Next slide, please. Um, waste composition studies are, are, are calculated every five years, and this is the 2015. They did a 2020 study as well. I couldn't grab hold of that study for this presentation, um, but this, it, this is the waste composition study. The city actually uses this waste composition study in its conversations with the public uh, and with city council. This is what goes into the trash stream. And, and what is in blue and what is in green is actually what is recyclable and compostable. And um, this is the difficulty of why um, uh, the city is not reaching its goals is there's too much recyclables and too much compostables in the waste stream. Um, we calculate that 50% capture rate at the household level of what is recyclable and what is compostable um, is going into the trash stream. And, and uh, so that is the focus of the education stream of, of the city of Austin. Um, it is a, a, an excellent array of services provided by Austin to its residents, but too much is going into the trash stream and not into the appropriate um, green and blue bins for um, uh, organics and, and recycling. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the basic philosophy of the city's uh, 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 zero waste plan, reduce, reuse, and recycle with reduce and reuse, very much part of the education programming and very much higher priority than recycling. Um, disposal um, is, is uh, on the negative side of the calculation, energy from waste and landfilling. Next slide. 
um, parts of the plan. Oh, just let, skip the slide. Go back one slide, please. Uh, yes, the plan is sectioned out um, um, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way so that recycling has a chapter, organics has a chapter, reuse has a chapter, and so forth. Chapter eight um, notes all the recycling opportunities, whether they're in uh, play or in the future. Um, and chapter 10 notes um, organics. And, and, and how we play out on the organics uh, um, uh, services that, that are um, uh, to be provided. Uh, recycling um, also notes um, recycling and organics services at the um, festivals, the music festivals and at the parks and at the um, street uh, level in the downtown area. And both, all those services are outlined in the, the zero waste plan in the appropriate chapters, chapter eight and chapter 10. Next slide, please. Chapter seven and chapter nine outlines the, the chapter seven is the reuse chapter. Chapter nine is the materials chapter materials management chapter, displaying the highest and best use philosophy, the reuse, the household hazardous waste uh, activities. Chapter 15 dedicates an entire chapter on recycling economic development, bringing new economic development to the city based on recycling activities and reuse activities, including materials market exchange, remanufacturing hub, bringing um, recycling activity to the city that consumes the recyclables that are generated in the city, a reuse entrepreneur op opportunities, a shop zero waste website for businesses within the city that are uh, engaged in zero waste activities. Next slide, please. Uh, chapter 20 in the zero waste plan are, are encouraging pilots and incentives, economic incentives from the city. Uh, we've engaged in a restaurant composting pilot where the um, restaurant association president um, um, was uh, uh, leading the, the charge on that pilot. Um, zero waste business rebates um, from the city, zero waste events, that's music festivals, um, a, a rebate if they perform a zero waste event and, and um, led, uh, led that event by the standards of, of the city on zero waste. Home composting rebates, $75. Uh, if, if the home engaged in composting and reported to the city for a year, their, their home composting activities. Um, outreach and education is, is highlighted in chapter 24, and that's the city's customer base, a mobile app and direct interaction with the city um, and citywide outreach. Um, we engage, a lot of people ask, how much do we spend? The city of Austin spends on um, education and outreach. And it's generally $1 per household per month is the general expenditure um, on staffing and expenditures on outreach and education, um, uh, direct expenditures, about a dollar per household per month. Uh, next slide. Um, this, these chapters, 16, 17, 18, and 19, are all the partnerships, the community partnerships that the city engages in. All city departments were required to engage in zero waste activities and accountable to the city manager. Um, we engage in zero waste activity at the uh, University of Texas, Austin, um, and research partnerships. Uh, we engage in partnerships with the Keep Austin Beautiful. Um, we work with the two recycling MRF processors in the city, um, uh, uh, partnerships with the stakeholders throughout the city. Our main number one uh, stakeholder is the community and we engage all or city ordinances, all new programs involved. Uh, number one, the community input before the uh, ordinances are developed and uh, public private partnerships the city engages, if, if it's not the direct services of the city, if it's a private um, um, service, this, the, 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 uh, the city um, engages in, in a direct pub, private public uh, partnership um, uh, service there. Next slide. Um, part of the uh, a key initiative of, of the uh, zero waste plan is chapter 21, the universal recycling and, and organics ordinance. This requires all multifamily and single family homes to have recycling services provided to every unit. That's including multifamily units. It does not require the resident to use the bin. It requires that the access be there on site. So every unit, every, uh, every residential unit in the city 
has recycling. It also requires that every business and every property owner in the city have access to recycling on site. So every, every building in the city is provided with recycling according to the universal recycling ordinance. Again, it's not a mandatory recycling ordinance that people have to recycle. It's a mandatory access ordinance uh, that uh, recycling is on site at every building in the city. Next slide, please. Um, recycling economic development. Um, the city is engaged in promoting recycling as an economic tool. And we've developed a, a, a position in the economic development office called the Recycling Economic Development Liaison. Natalie Betts has been hired to promote that position and, and that activity. And we did an economic study and found that the economic impact of recycling and reuse in the Austin region is $720 million annually and 2,600 jobs. Um, uh, many states have done this type of economic study. This is just the Austin region itself. We engage in Austin Re Recycling Innovations Investment Forums, uh, where, where businesses pitch their, um, their inventions and their thoughts about reuse and recycling to investment uh, in, uh, investors, uh, in, uh, angel investors. We have uh, a materials exchange for the Austin region. We, we are attempting to create a circular economy around localized markets within 50 miles of Austin. And we have built out a buy local, buy zero waste uh, exchange network. Next slide, please. Um, I'm running out of time. I just want to note the various different ordinances and, and thought processes within our zero waste plan. It's uh, the, or, the residential program is based on a pay as you throw rate structure. Um, all the other ordinances are built out on uh, community involvement and community uh, engagement before all these programs have been built out. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I did talk about the economic study and economic impact. Um, I, every time I go to city council, I talk about the climate impact of our programs every budget season. When we talk about um, our, our annual program and our annual um, uh, impact, I, I display this chart and, and our uh, carbon footprint. And, and it displays the uh, positive effects of recyclables and organics uh, versus the landfilling of material. Next slide, please. And I also display the economic cost per household of our programming. Our, this is single family household service. Landfilling uh, is always more costly than recycling and, and uh, yard trimmings. The, pr the, the pride of, uh, of the Austin program is we're cost efficient on our recycling and, and yard trimming and brush. Um, this is without food waste, add $5 per household when we added in the, um, uh, the food waste uh, uh, weekly service. So it's about $10 per month for the organic service with the food waste. Um, next slide, please. And uh, zero, zero, what zero waste is, many of you do know, but this is Austin's definition of zero waste. Next slide, please. And what zero waste is not, is not incineration. It's not mixed waste processing. It's not linear waste management. Next slide, please. And my last slide that I wanted to mention as I run out of time is that Austin took the three phases of zero waste very seriously. The first phase is access to services, make, building up the, the, the proper array of services. Phase two, the participation, building up the participation. The set out rate of, of recycling carts in the single family households is now 85 to 95% throughout the city. That's the participation that we built out. Uh, phase three is what the city of Austin is now in, recovering what's left over. And, and the recovery is, is, is that capture rate, trying to get the capture rate built up at, at the residential level, as well as the ICI um, uh, portion of the waste stream. That's where Austin is right now, is in phase three. Next slide, please. And that uh, concludes my PowerPoint and my contact information at the bottom, my email. You can feel free to contact me and I can answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Bob. Uh, this was an ambitious uh, undertaking to do all this within 90 minutes. 
Uh, this is the beginning of a discussion in New York, so we easily could have taken a half day, three days, uh, five weeks, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, we've only got about 20 minutes left, and I want to give uh, Jen McDonald uh, the uh, first opportunity to, uh, to ask questions on behalf of the city to the uh, presenters. Uh, Jen joined the Department of Sanitation last, uh, late last uh, year as the Director of Solid Waste Management Planning after being Director of Resource Recovery at uh, the city's DEP and working uh, in the industry in the Northeast, particularly focused on organics. So uh, Kendra, you can put us all back on screen. And do we have Jen with us, I hope? Yes, can you hear me? Terrific, Jen, Good. take it away. Thank you, everyone. And I'll, I'll try to keep this um, equitable and uh, 10 minutes for me and maybe 10 minutes for our um, guests uh, who might have some questions in the chat. Uh, but I, I'd like to start by asking the, the panelists here and maybe not all of you um, will have an answer to this, but in New York City, we are solid waste planning is guided by the state. Um, it's actually a requirement by law that we go through this planning exercise. Um, and previously it was thought to be about a 20 year time frame, and they've revised that to be a 10 year time frame. And they're a bit prescriptive in what they would like to see and alternatives they want us to consider. So I'm curious if um, any of you who've been working on planning have had sort of that level of oversight or um, regulatory requirement to your work. Not for the city of Boston. Uh, the state has, uh, Massachusetts has its own cell, uh, zero waste plan, which we consulted, but they it was not a requirement of our planning process. Sarah, do you hand up? <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah, our, in British Columbia, we are kind of in local government our role in solid waste management is legislated by the province as well, the Environmental Management Act, and there's another act that governs our regional district. And so a solid waste management plan, what it does, what it should include is all stipulated by the province. They have very detailed guidelines for how we update our solid waste management plan. And our approach, our board and our leadership have said, you know, our we're, we're half of the province, we'd like to kind of even go above and beyond what's outlined within that plan. And so absolutely, we will meet those requirements. Um, but we're looking to kind of go above and beyond as well and seeing what role we have as a regional district to kind of leverage all the other climate work that's being done provincially and federally, all the other initiatives that are underway in this space. So yes, we absolutely um, work within this regulatory environment. But you know, there's opportunities through the kind of broad, broad range of partners that work in the solid waste recycling waste reduction space to kind of expand beyond that, or at least identify those partnerships that will lead that work if it's not us that can, but there's a real important role for us to kind of convene and um, catalyze some of that work. Great, thank you. Anyone else? If not, I will move on to uh, my next question. Uh, which is, I appreciate uh, somewhat similar perhaps undercurrent of the transformation of our, our industry, I'd say, over the last couple of decades from, um, you know, access to recycling to organics to maybe now we're talking about the circular economy a little bit more and what that means for sustainable cities. Uh, and I'm curious if um, folks in your jurisdictions have specific examples of ways that you're trying to um, extract resources and reuse them locally through some sort of remanufacturing. And I'm specifically more interested not in reuse or organics, because I think those are pretty well um, figured out or, or we know how we might be able to get there. But I'm interested in more complex um, materials or industries that seem to be um, having some success or you're interested in trying to work with um, in your area? Yeah, Sarah. I could, I could share a few examples. So as a you know regional government, we have these 23 different entities. So there's lots of really interesting and compelling work that's going on around the region. And I'll just name a few, like I know 
the city of Richmond and through the National Zero Waste Council, there's a really interesting pilot project on recycled asphalt and I can provide mm -hmm. links, but that's a pretty interesting one that's underway. And I think there's kind of opportunities to expand that one. Um, in the construction and demolition space in, in Vancouver and in, in our region, there's a lot of really cool work being done on deconstruction. There's a lot mm -hmm. of cool work being done on kind of using those um, materials in other local businesses. And I think it's a real opportunity and they're just kind of looking for, um, you know, ways to expand that around the region. Um, I know in the textile space, like Vancouver is a real hub for graders and sorters of textile mm. waste. So, you know, we generate it here in region, but we also sort a lot of it in region from across North America. And I was at a really cool session last week with a local charity union gospel mission and they um you know they have a, a a store where they sell secondhand goods but they also have a little social enterprise that they're creating where a lot of their members actually are learning sewing skills and they're repurposing a lot of the kind of broken clothing that's received through there and I think they said they made like hundred thousand dollars last year and actually repairing that clothing and selling it in their shop so there's a lot of cool initiatives that are on a larger scale, but on a, a smaller scale too that you see in region. Those are just a few I'd, I'd flag. Great, thanks. Megan, you might have some also? Yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple of comments that maybe dance a little bit around the question, but I, I also wanted to, um, just building on, on what Sarah was mentioning around construction and demolition waste, because there was a, a question for me in the chat as well. And I think one of the sort of unique challenges for the city of Toronto is we're looking to expand um, beyond our long-term waste management strategy into the circular economy space, um, is some of the, the regulatory or jurisdictional limits that we have to have to navigate. And so, um, you know, for example, we uh, have, a, have a very different uh, a regulatory ecosystem than there is in BC for, for construction, especially around uh, building codes and local building codes. Um, and, you know, there were several uh, potential actions uh, identified in our long-term waste management strategy around uh, reducing and recovering construction and demolition waste, um, which, you know, several challenges, uh, largely economic challenges, uh, kind of arose in trying to implement those. Um, as well on, you know, on our system, we we actually don't manage very much construction and demolition mm -hmm. waste. Um, we primarily uh, uh, take, you know, small household renovation and, you know, do recycle drywall and, and porcelain, but um, there's a whole construction industry that we don't touch at all in the city of Toronto. And so um, it's because the construction sector has been identified through our circular economy work as a major material consumption and waste generating sector with very low diversion rates. Um, there, there is going to be work in the future exploring what we can do. I think that there's a lot of uh, dialogue happening uh, in Canada right now around how uh, construction standards and design standards can help unlock some potential in reducing um, end of life uh, construction waste and also continuing uh, to support the economics of recovery. Uh, the Canadian Standards Association is doing a lot of work in, in that area. Um, so I think that's going to be a really important opportunity for us moving forward. And uh, sorry, actually, one thing I should mention, too, is that through we're, we're trying to explore how circular economy principles can be applied in procurement at the city of Toronto. And hmm. I think for us, that will be a, a really interesting lever to explore and uh, moving forward about how um, some of the, the kind of pilot projects that we're working on can can achieve more circular outcomes in construction. So I think for us, that that's a, another way of kind of getting in those in those spaces where we don't necessarily have the waste authority, but we have other levers available to us in other parts of our of our waste operation. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I think it's a it's a thorny question, but a really um, a really important one for us to be tackling in the future, given the environmental impact. Yeah, and I think it also is supported by a, a global trend, as I understand it, of sort of reurbanization, right, and an expectation that we'll continue to see concentrations of people in urban centers, and with that would come a lot of construction, I would think. So we, we, we will have the market demand at least for maybe that stream of resources. Um, okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one more question before we maybe go to the ones in the chat. And that is, uh, I think we all have pie charts in our um, planning documents that say, here's our waste stream and this much is organics and we think we know how to recover that. And this much is recycling and we, and we think, you know, we're working on recovering that and this much is reusable. And then there's that chunk, I think one presenters was about 40% that we really don't have, um, we really don't have a good answer for. So uh, my question is what's in that 40% for you from your perspective, from the work you've done on waste characterization 
Um, and where are you um, maybe trying to put some energy into either shifting some percentage of that to other pieces of the pie or trying to get it out of the pie? So um, that might be a tricky question, but um, hopefully it makes sense. And Bob, Bob wants to jump in now. Yeah, I, I, I think part of it, it's a different percentage in each community, it, it, anywhere from 10 to 40%, like you mentioned. And it's, it's, um, that's where you're talking about uh, designing upstream. Um, it's it's de designed for recycling and it's designing out the toxics. It, that's where you get into EPR, extended producer responsibility. And it's some some may say that's outside the reach of municipalities. I don't I don't agree. I think that's where the municipalities start to get into the EPR conversation. And and that's where I talk to the residents and the, the universities. And, and um, in, in Austin, I talked to UT Austin about um, research. Um, into design for recyclability. I talked to Austin about uh, UT Austin about uh, EPR research and so forth. Um, we need research uh, at, at the universities, mm -hmm. but we also need the political conversation of, of uh, and, and I know New York's very much involved in that EPR conversation and what's the best direction for EPR and what is a bad EPR bill as well, too. I know, I know you're <laughs> in the heat of that discussion as well, too. But um, it's not just politics, but it's also design and, and mm -hmm. what is a, gr a good green design for, for our products. And I think that's sometimes missing in the discussion on EPR is, is the design of the products and and when you're talking, when when you really look at at a, a waste composition study, and you're actually looking at what cannot be recycled and what cannot be composted, you're talking at multi-material uh, uh, um, products that we really need to stop producing. <laughs> and so it's 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 at the production level, and it's not that may not be addressed by EPR and we need we need consumers to stop purchasing certain items so it it's at the it's at the at, at the consumer level as well too mm. um sarah and megan seem like they want to add to this um maybe megan first Sure. I just want to uh, really underscore and emphasize the importance of producer responsibility on that. And I, I think, you know, not <laughs> I'm not coming forward with a solution, but a challenge that, that you know, we face as well is that we aren't infinitely uh, adaptable uh, when it comes to our, our the infrastructure choices that we make on waste management. Right. And so a really thorny challenge for us is that, you know, in the city of Toronto, one of our, our proudest waste management uh, accomplishments is our Green Bin program. We've been offering Green Bin to all of our customers, single family and multi residential since 2002. Um, and it's it's a huge accomplishment for us. And we see really significant participation rates. Um, but the, the nature of consumer products and packaging from 2002 to 2022 has changed a lot. Um, and so our ability to adapt infrastructure to respond to new products year over year that are not what our infrastructure was designed for is a significant challenge. And so I think that dialogue with producers and taking responsibility for the, the what they're putting on the market is really, really critical. Um, you know, to protect existing infrastructure and to foster innovation, because there's so much more that can be done uh, as we're designing. If we're also thinking of end of life and recovery strategies um, from the outset, as opposed to just passing that off to, to somebody else like a municipality to deal with. So really want to <laughs> underscore that producer responsibility side is critical. Great. Yeah. And Sarah? Yeah, just echoing what Bob and, and Megan have shared, agree. Um, but also I, I shared a link to our waste pond study in the chat, like we still have a lot of the, you know, basic materials in there, the compostable plastics, the paper, uh, pardon me, the compostables, the plastics, the paper, like that still exists. So your kind of traditional outreach and education may be doing it differently to kind of get at those materials is super important. Our waste pump study um, over the last couple of years looked at single use items and PPE, which was super interesting. Mm. So not a huge source when you look percentage wise in the waste, but I think it's really important because it reflects on the decisions that people make every day and their consumption and their management of those materials. And the numbers are striking. Like I'm looking at it here, like, I don't know, something like combined, what is this PPE combined 100 nine million masks disposed in our region of like 2.6 million people like the numbers are striking when you like in masks COVID of course you can't get away from all that but when you look at the single use items you know 
combined 359 million um, units disposed in this region of single use items in a year. So some of those numbers are very striking and just, you know, worthy of reflection and, and the importance of kind of behavioral change around how we use these things. For sure. I mean, I think the pandemic has really altered our existence in this space. The question is, for how long, right? And in what, you know, what are, are these effects lasting? Uh, Susan? Well, I was just going to make the uh, comment about um, not so much uh, uh, other waste streams, the smaller pieces of the pie, but um, in terms of biosolids, I'm interested, I know New York City's got to be facing this. And as we go into uh, curbside collection for our food waste and where it's destined to go, um, we have gotten, and I saw Cambridge was on the, uh, uh, on the call earlier, they went through uh, dealing with pushback from um, uh, uh, community members about um, biosolids versus composting. And that is something that we're dealing with as well. And since Maine has just adopted that no biosolids are going to be placed on um, lands, I was curious um, if your New York City is concerned, because I know you've got all those anaerobic digest, I mean, wastewater treatment um, facilities around the uh, city. Um, if you're yes, dealing with that. That's true. There are 14 of them. <laughs> um, as Kendall said, I actually worked at that agency for, for a bit of time. And I think it's a it's something that we're, you know, monitoring for sure. Um, the Northeast has um, faced more challenges to it in a practical way than than we have yet in this region. Um, but certainly something that um, we're aware of and keeping an eye on. And I, I think that the conversation should be balanced um, from my perspective. You know, there are so many um, problems we're trying to solve. Um, and I think many would argue that the climate challenge is maybe the biggest one, although maybe not the most immediate one. So it's, it's figuring out how to balance some of those um, competing interests. I think we only have a few minutes left, um, but I did wanna raise one question that was in the, the um, submitted by our attendees that I thought was very interesting, which is from Kristen Lasky about um, informal waste collectors in circular economy. So folks, um, we have, a, a, I guess we call them canners here uh, in New York City who are out um, you know, collecting bottles and, and just interested if folks are seeing that um, sort of waste picking action um, on other commodities in your regions? And if um, you as a jurisdiction have engaged with sort of that informal um, economy at all. Well, I'll say I'm interested in engaging with that informal economy more because uh, some of it, of it is, uh, seems to be around the reusables and uh, building materials. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling as though those small um, businesses might, if they know that there's an initiative from the city to do more of this, would be the ones to tap into to, to um, grow those businesses uh, and unearth them more for us to use um, uh, across the city more. Well, you know, Susan, the, uh, you know, the scrappers uh, on the scrap metal side have been around for, you know, a uh, couple hundred years and are part of that informal, um, you know, uh, uh, diversion and collection and recycling sector in New York that doesn't get, uh, you know, much attention paid to it. Uh, and it happens, uh, you know, material you know, disappears off the curb and uh, gets recycled uh, through that system. Uh, and Jen, you, uh, thanks very much. And we are at the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, and uh, thank you all very much for your participation today. Uh, for the attendees that are left, I've noted in the chat that we will be distributing the presentation and the link to the recording. And you can look forward to uh, you know, further discussions like this over the next uh, three or four years as we get uh, started <laughs> in the process uh, in New York. Definitely. Uh, hang in there, Jen. <laughs> gonna be, gonna, gonna Thanks be for quite, all your wisdom, gonna, friends. Gonna be quite the ride. Yeah, good, good. So, with that, I think we will uh, end it and wish you all a, a good day and evening. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Kendall, thank you. for thank your you. great job in moderating. Thank you. Bye. Bye.